retirement communities that line the Florida coast, millions of Americans enjoy what are sometimes called the golden years. Never before have so many enjoyed health and vitality in the season of late adulthood. I feel like 16 years old, even though I'm close to 80. And uh, it's just a wonderful, unbelievable thing, all of it. It's just like a dream. This peaceful dream can be haunted by concern about physical decline. But in spite of some physical changes, most adults stay active in family and community affairs. They continue to do things they've done all their lives. We don't have time to sit down and worry about if we've got anything wrong with it. That's the worst thing in the world. Not all so-called senior citizens know how to act their age, and they're challenging our ideas about the final season of life. For many people, retirement signals the end of one chapter and the beginning of another, opening a door on new challenges and opportunities. I feel how they feel, and I think that's important for everybody to feel that someone cares. That's an emotion that I don't think we ever outgrow. Beyond the age of 60, many of us will face major life transitions, such as the loss of a life partner, and we'll have to learn to adapt to new ways of living. We were married for over 50 years. And when I look back at it, I have only the... the most inner, innermost beautiful, wonderful thoughts about him. And finally, we may learn to look boldly at the mystery which lies at the end of the season. If you're talking about when you're 90, whether you're thinking about dying, you see, well, that's something people have to think about any time. This is a program about growth and change in the season of late adulthood. With the help of experts in human development, we'll explore some of the challenges that face us in this season. We'll meet people who will share their stories, and we'll discover that their stories are part of our story, part of the seasons of life. If you're 60 today, you're a pioneer. You're exploring territory few of our grandparents ever saw. Uh, they didn't live as long as we will. They didn't look forward to this period we call retirement. For most of us, late adulthood is a kind of extra season of life. But we still face one of the challenges they faced, and that is to try to tie up the strands of our life story, to ask, was my story a good one? Was it true to who I was? Are there still a few last things I might do to try to give my life story a better ending? In South Philadelphia, a new season is beginning for a couple who have operated a family butcher shop for almost 40 years, Harry Creamy and his wife, Antoinette. Being 61 now, I wonder where all those years went from being 20 and 30. Time has passed so fast. Uh, you know, my children have grown up so fast. And, uh, you know, of course, like, like we said, I'm a grandparent now, and uh, my grandchildren are coming up now. I thought when I became 60, life would be easier, but I find it isn't, because there's more things to do at home. There's more activities. I've been married 40 years. <laughs> I met my wife on a blind date in Atlantic City. <laughs> We got married 1948. I was born in this house 1926, August the 5th, up on the third floor. My parents came here and got married in 1920 and had three children. I grew up here, we played here, we went to St. Paul School. My friends are from here. All my life was spent in this particular neighborhood. You cut the meat. I got into the business when I got married. My father-in-law invited me to help him with the business, and uh, eventually we went into a partnership agreement. You got three pounds there? How much? Huh? He is going on 93. There? He'll be 93 in November. Oh. Yeah, put on a scale, see if you got three pounds. He's been living with us, 
And he gets down here like uh, four or five times a week. He, his wife passed away in 1971. And then he had another daughter beside my wife that passed away in 1970. Since then, my wife has been taking care of him like she does her own children and, and me. Don't eat too much bread. We have a steak for you. That's the only worry I have is that I should go before my father and I wouldn't want anyone to put my father away. My father belongs home. He deserves the honor and glory of dying at home like my mother did. My husband could take care of himself. My children can, but I worry about my father. I wouldn't want no one to put him anywhere other than his own home. God, when he wants me, he can take me. Nobody just stop. You don't take good people. Huh? You don't take good people right away. No, you don't want to. He's better off without him. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody just stop. Business-wise, we're the third generation, and of course, if any one of my children took it over, that would be the fourth generation. I have one boy that lives on top of my business here. At this time, it is a definite possibility that I may take it over, although I've not made up my mind yet. And this is my playground. This is where I grew up. I really can't say that I would trade it for anything else. It was a learning experience, not only as a trade, but as I grew closer to my, by my parents because of it. And I appreciate how, how hard they worked and how difficult their life is to work in that business. The neck, the rack, I can cut your piece like this. Well, I've been working here 39 years. <laughs> in fact, my first vacation was only two years ago. Okay. I broke him. See, that's like a big bone oh, wow. to a dinosaur. Where's this right? from? Is his leg? All right, because we're going to grind it. I spoil my grandchild more than my own. And my children will always say that. But I feel I give more to him. He asks me for everything. I will go buy him everything he wants. I know it's spoiling him, but that's a grandmother's love. What else can you do? All right, now go here. here when here. you raise your own children oh, and you're in business, you don't have time to cater to your children. Like I find in particular now, I, uh, even though I don't have time, I, I make time for my grandchildren. What do you call them, Damien? Bacon burgers. The biggest important thing to me is... Uh, my family life and raising my children and seeing that they had a good education. If there's one piece of advice I would give to the new parent, try to talk to them. See what they're thinking. See what they're saying. You just hope and pray today with this dope, the drinking, and their companion. You have to ask them who they go with. Bring their friends into your house. Entertain them. Mothers today have to do a lot more than we did in the sense of of uh, keeping their children at home. Try to, at least. That's the only way you're going to have a happy family. The door's always open. I got news for you. They all have say, keys to coming. my house. They all walk in the time they want. <laughs> There's no need. There is no invitation. This is their home. They were born and raised there. I'm the mother. He's the father. So even my children are, uh, two of my boys are both in professional field. I still, uh, you know, I still hold the, uh, it open to them that if, uh, if they ever wanted to come into the business, the door is still open. For Harry Creamy, the door is opening on a new season. But what will this season be like? Well, the biological clock that measures our lifespan hasn't changed, not since the beginnings of human history. We've always been capable of living to be 100. But until early in this century, most people lived to be only about 50. Now most of us can look forward to being 75 or older. What are we to do with this new season, with all these extra years, with all this time? The Creamies decided to keep on working. Uh, some decide to retire at 65 or earlier. Retirement is a new phenomenon, a new setting of society's timetable, the social clock. At the beginning of this century, the social clock had people working right up until death. Not until Social Security in 1935 could we look forward to retiring. After 40 years with the U.S. Post Office, Tom Russell retired. He's 61. His wife, Vivian, is 60. She also just retired. She was a social worker. For the Russells, retirement will have its own rewards after decades of hard work. Today, they're showing their daughters and grandson something they just bought, their dream house. 
Yeah. So we're not going to do a whole lot here until that's done. Because we're going to dig this yeah, out. Because they have to come out here. Cut yeah. the landscape to here and put shrub in here. Because yeah. it's a little bit too bad here. We need to do something in here. Yeah. I consider myself a success so because the humble background I came from to where I am now, and it just didn't happen. That just didn't happen. I didn't hit a lottery. I didn't hit a million dollar sweet state. All I achieved was achieved by good heart on its way. My childhood, what's the kind of childhood that you would get from a, a black in the South back in the late 30s and early 40s? It was a total segregated South, segregated facilities. I'm a product of that environment, so it was a struggle. It was a constant struggle. My escape from that type of environment was uh, the Army. I think the Army opened up a lot of things for the blacks done back in the 40s. Because it gave, it gave them a chance to move to other areas and to kind of get out of that niche they was in. We struggled together. And I think that's what made us real close. We had a lot of hard climbs, you know. Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to use the, the set of pictures on this wall and put the small red chair here. So I'm, I'm from a family of nine and a very poor family. And I think it uh, gave me a lot of stamina to make something out of nothing. What I learned from my parents, I think, basically, was a sense of pride. I was working on doing day work, and this young lady was sitting there at a piano like this one playing Claire de Lune, and I'm doing her kitchen floors, and her husband came in and complimented her for what a gorgeous, clean house. You know, I said, hey, this won't work. <laughs> this is not going to work. And at that point, I decided I have to do something other than graduate from high school. So then I decided that I needed to go to night school. Their struggle has given Vivian and Tom a sense of obligation to the community, the total community. For them, retirement's a time to give something back. Tom brings a message of Christian love and guidance to inmates at a federal prison. Bringing Christ to the to the guys in the prison was an achievement. We gave them a new sense of direction, a new sense of ways to go. And I think it's very important that we do that. But I wasn't as uh, outreached mm -hmm. and wide open as I am now. That so that's what, that's what you're primarily into? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He I, need that outside influence. He needs someone to come in there and tell him that he loved and, that, and someone care for him. And, and, you can change your ways and you got a second chance in life and he needs someone to do that and I think that's what we do. In a Detroit hospice, terminally ill patients are made as comfortable as possible. When I'm bathing, I notice that nails are... Vivian Russell, as a volunteer, dirty. is learning how she can provide that comfort. I need to feel that I'm doing something do. constructive. And there's only one person... I have a sense of how they here. feel if I turn them off their back and I give them a back rub, I stimulate the circulation, make the sheets cool and dry, now, and then them over, turn them in a different position. Here. I feel how they feel. And I think that's important for everybody to feel that someone cares. That's an emotion that I don't think we ever outgrow. How we can continue to do what we're doing? How we can, we can go out in a blaze of glory? I, think I hope we can continue to, to work and help people and show our warmness and and do the things that we that we're doing now. I just hope we could we can continue to do it, and I hope we can do it together. And I hope we we will do it together. Really, it's going to be interesting. How interesting depends on how energetic we are in those some twenty five years of retirement. There are many people over sixty who are so involved in life, they've been given a new name. The Young Olds. Putting this idea of young old into perspective is a lifespan researcher at the University of Chicago, Bernice Newgarden. About 75, 80 percent at any given time are what I have called young old people. That is, they are not frail. They are healthy, active, engaged in their families, engaged in their communities. They act very much like middle-aged people, except they're retired or their work patterns have changed very markedly. That young old phenomenon is a new historical development in societies like our own and in modern Western societies. 
Being young old isn't a matter of how old you are, the biological clock, but how old you feel, the psychological clock. When he studies the nighttime sky here at the observatory at Princeton University, a 74-year-old astronomer still feels young. At his age, he believes there's plenty of time to continue learning, even to pursue his dream of putting a telescope in space. With that telescope, Lyman Spitzer hopes that future generations will be able to see the universe as no one has before. I think the human animal is made in such a way that you can't, that it's difficult for, for too long a period to just uh, get satisfaction from what one has done. I think one needs more than that, at least I do. Lyman Spitzer was born in Toledo, Ohio in 1914, almost a half century before the first NASA launch. He has always had his eye on the stars and beyond. Many years ago, I was an avid science fiction enthusiast and read uh, uh, science fiction magazines and books and was uh, always interested in space travel and travel to other planets and things of that sort. I became fascinated with the thought of connecting cities in the world by underground tubes and sh shooting cars through in vacuo, accelerating them electromagnetically and then decelerating them by magnetic forces also. With this one can show that one can get from New York to San Francisco in eight or nine minutes and uh, I spent a lot of time planning such a system in great detail. I told my parents about it and they became very seriously worried. They made me promise I wouldn't think about those tubes again for, I think, a period of six months. <laughs> I suppose a light came into my eyes when I talked about them. They thought I was going over. <laughs> I was really getting a little batty. <laughs> Maybe they were right. Lyman Spitzer, in late adulthood, is still a person in process. He isn't ready to close the book on his life story. Not yet. The Hubble telescope, which Spitzer helped design, was recently launched by NASA. It will investigate galaxies as they were some 10 billion years ago. It may tell us about the origin of the universe. I'm sure it, the space telescope will not answer all of our questions it will raise more problems, but it will certainly get us closer to the goal of answering the big questions of how did the universe start, what is its fate. You can actually see a little something or other on the water after the circle spreads. My family life has been a source of enduring satisfaction. The luckiest thing I ever did was uh, when I got married, it was only after after our marriage, that I discovered how, uh, how nice she really was. <laughs> the actual line Lyman and Doreen like Spitzer have been world. married for nearly 50 years. They've raised four children and shared a love of great music. Yes, yes. We wear well. We, we seem to do the, the right things for each other so that we don't get tired of each other. And if I may say something more about Lyman Spitzer, he has an infinite capacity for being interesting and, and, and different. Should we leap lightly across the brook and land heavily in the middle of it? <laughs> the Spitzers also share a love of nature and a passion for outdoor challenge. Lyman! Yes! On belay! Climbing! People are sometimes a little startled on cliffs when they find out how old I am. No one has ever uh, reproached me for being overly rash at my age. The bucket above. The bucket's really good. Up rope, please. Tension. There are some routes where there are uh, long periods of the cliff where you can't stop and rest. Once you've started, uh, you have to keep going because there's no place where you can stop and just relax. Uh, you're sort of hanging on and you have to keep going up. Many routes, and even some quite difficult ones, are not of that character. So I see no reason why I can't go on climbing for some years yet. Okay, well. Super. Great climb, great climb. I believe that change is easier, obviously, when one is young than when one is old. But I don't think it's impossible by any means as one gets older and older. I've been thinking of ways in which I might perhaps change some aspect of my professional activity, 
perhaps I should take a more active role in computing. My office at the moment is the only one in the astronomy building uh, that doesn't have a computer console on the desk. I let graduate students do the computing for me. But maybe it's time to change. Maybe I should uh, take time out and, and learn, uh, learn computing, and uh, I may do that. Uh, my children have been encouraging me to take up some musical instrument, uh, which I uh, am considering and uh, may do. On the other hand, perhaps I won't. I don't know. What he does know is that the gift of healthy life has given him more time to search for understanding. Our chances of understanding the evolution of a human being in the same sense that we understand uh, the evolution of a star are really very uh, are far away. Life is so much more complicated than, than uh, the physical processes that astronomers study that uh, uh, I can well imagine that long after we know all that we need to know about the universe, we may still be trying to understand the nature of, nature of life. The important thing about aging is that it should open up options. It doesn't say there's no right way to age, there's no wrong way to age. The way to age is to retain a sense of self and to have a part of a society that you can feel you belong to. And if you choose to make choices, you ought to have the option for those choices. For many thousands of young old Americans who worked hard all their lives, one choice is leisure in retirement communities, including this one at Holiday Springs, Florida. Here, as in many other retirement communities, the major topics of discussion include the uncertainties of the weather, sweaters for grandchildren up north, shuffleboard with grandchildren down south, and the pace and quality of the daily game of gin rummy. Like many in America today, these Sunbelt retirees are still actively involved, many in charity work up north while spending the winters in Florida. They're called snowbirds. There are other pleasures in retirement, escaping the daily job grind and finding new intimacy in a relationship. Milton Band, another snowbird, is a retired lawyer. He's been here nine years. He's 78. I don't feel any older than I did at any other time. I may not be able to play singles, but I can play doubles. Nice shot. When I lived in East Boston as a youngster, the playgrounds didn't even have nets. We used to have our own net and cart it to Wood Island Park a mile or so away. But it wasn't really until after retirement that I had the time to do it, and that's my source of exercise. In, in retirement, my time is my own. When I was practicing law, I was everybody else's messenger. I had to key in on their problems. The only problem I have to key in on now is my wife, myself, and our health. So I take a walk and walk over to the pool and even fly around by myself. And I think, isn't this beautiful? And I feel like 16 years old, even though I'm close to 80. And uh, it's just a wonderful, unbelievable thing, all of it. It's just like a dream. Rowena Band was a bookkeeper. She made $35 a week salary back in 1934. 
That money helped put Milton through law school. Today, over 50 years later, they enjoy grandparenting and freedom from work pressure. The biggest thing about this phase of your life is to be out of the rat race. Not to have your husband get up in the morning and, and face a judge in a courtroom, a, a banknote, a client, and all these various things. When I look at him and see him get up in the morning and not have these worries, it, it has a wonderful effect on me. I am so delighted and so pleased. I mean, I can't pass Milton without touching his hair. When you have the children around and you're younger, you haven't even got time for this sort of thing. But at this time of your life, you need somebody to touch and to feel and to, and to love you and still call you, you know, sweetheart or, or something really affectionate. It's extremely important. We both are very affectionate, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The kind of sexuality that emerges later in life, for example, after the 40s, 50s, 60s, may be oriented more toward nurturance, the relationship, uh, more concerned with the broader meaning of sexuality, which includes a broader aspect of uh, sensory experience and not only uh, the experience of intercourse itself. Just as age does not make wisdom automatically, so too age does not make uh, successful lovemaking or warm marital relationships automatic. It's really something we all have to work at. That's probably the single biggest lesson about life in general is the need for each of us to take responsibility for our own growth and development. All of us react differently to the physical effects of our later years. Some feel sexual into their 70s and 80s, others may not. Some feel young and exuberant, others old and tired. But at some point, the biological clock catches up with all of us. We start to worry about our health, about losing our mental capabilities, about the fact that life will come to an end. Here on the Kennedy farm, four generations of Kennedys are getting together to celebrate. <laughs> Justin Kennedy is one. On this occasion, the end of life is the farthest thing from the mind of Francis Kennedy, who is 70. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing, we just, we just got a good bunch of kids and a good bunch of grandchildren and I attribute it all, all to one thing. Nobody ever handed them a thing. They had to work for it all. Whatever the season, Francis still works on the family farm, which he passed on to his son Jim, 45, and his grandson Jeffrey, 23. Francis's wife, Martha, 73, is still very much his partner in work and in life. He helps as much as he can, and I think he still has that feeling of belonging, and that's what you have to. When you're retired, you have to have something to belong to. Francis Kennedy belongs to his family, and he's left them a way of life, but he also belongs to a larger community. In 1965, he was elected to the Pennsylvania legislature, where he served for more than a decade. One of the things he's proudest of is having helped create a recreation site that families will enjoy for generations. Marine State Park was a dream of many people. And after I was elected to the legislature, one of the first bills I prepared was for $2 million to start that. The amount of people that really enjoy that. Though I'm only a little cog in the wheel that made it possible, I appreciate the little part that I have was able to play in that. Mm, gosh, there's two, four, five, five kids. One of the things I enjoy more today Six and two uh, old is just going up there on Moraine in the evening whenever all the sailboats are out. It's a good place to go to dream. Francis and Martha, along with their dreams, have anxieties about their health. Both have a history of heart problems. We're not getting any older, but the summers are getting closer. And as the summers get closer, maybe we find some joints that we didn't have before, and maybe uh, our toes don't. But uh, 
you know, it's not a matter of age, it's just the summers are getting closer. Don't be gentle with it. You know, who would have ever thought that thing gonna sit there as long as it did would ever have been like that? A lot of our friends have passed on very suddenly and uh, we know it can happen to us. So we are trying to prepare for that uh, by making our will, by purchasing our uh, cemetery lot. Uh, those things are hard for some people to do. But I think Francis and I have followed our belief in God that we know that uh, there is coming a day and uh, we'll approach it in just the same manner as we did in life. Hey, I'll tell you what, you're going to be surprised. Get these nails out of here, that thing's gonna clean up. The other night, uh, she was roasting a chicken and place going out to uh, turn the uh, heat down on it, she turned it up. And uh, the chicken got a little, little dark, but it was good anyhow, and she was worried about that, and they said, well, I kidded her a little bit about the summer's getting closer. <laughs> but I go, the chicken was good. We all do things. I'll bet you've done some of the same darn things. <laughs> well, I couldn't get the points of them things long watch, enough. Watch that hole. Yeah. I think one of the things we both do, we keep active. We're doing something. We don't have time to sit down and worry about if we've got anything wrong with it. That's the worst thing in the world. Why well, you you can sit down or I can sit down. Me and oh, we can we could really cry the blues with each other. That wouldn't do any good. So you gotta get going. Tomorrow's another day. Be ready for it. Meet it as a challenge. The challenge of living even one more day can seem insurmountable if you're alone and have no way of taking care of yourself. Too many frail, disabled, elderly people have no place to go. Uh, social programs used to provide some uh, dignity and security for those in nursing homes, but many of those programs have been cut back or scrapped entirely. Nearly two million people in our country find being sick and dependent almost unbearable. Thirty-five percent of all sick elderly Americans will spend their life savings in a nursing home before they die. Ellen Haynes is a former governess. She's 94. I couldn't live by myself if I hadn't had a stroke. I would have to be in a home like this because you can't live by yourself no more. People go in there and beat you up, kill you. They didn't do that when I come along. Because if I had a knew that I was going to be like this, I would have made more arrangements for myself. Because this way I didn't make nothing. The doctors put me here. I wanted to go back in my one little apartment with one hand. I would have tried to make it. I would have made it. But they said, no, I couldn't. So. Whether they live in nursing homes or not, one of the mysteries of the biological clock is that it runs out sooner for men than for women. Dr. Carl Eisdorfer, University of Miami. It may very well be that we're going to have to not only look at ways to help the elderly women, but ways to understand why men die younger when we're supposed to be equally uh, uh, sexually uh, unbiased. And it's clear that men are not doing as well. Uh, maybe it's because of their lifestyles, maybe it's because of the macho image that says that the man doesn't talk to anybody, you know, he takes it and 
maybe this has some real untoward effects on stress and so on. But clearly the difference in sexes has now become, and mortality and morbidity has become large enough to become, I think, a significant social problem. In Chicago, a unique residential center. It provides community living for those who have lost their spouses. Most of them are women. They share daily work and memories. One of the residents in this group home is Miriam Heifetz, who lost her husband a year ago. We were married for over 50 years. It was the best thing that ever happened in my life. The love for my husband grew. It just grew. It made my life. I mean, this was it for me. And when I look back at it, I have only the... the most inner, innermost beautiful, wonderful thoughts about him because our life was good. We had a good life together. We understood each other. We, we went through whatever we had to go through together. And there's nothing, nothing that I can think of in our marriage that would have made it any more the most wonderful thing for me. The, the reason I decided I can't live alone anymore was I was terribly lonely. I went through a period of deep depression. I would have to go shopping. I would go into that supermarket and I would stand there. I wouldn't know what to buy. A nursing home I never even thought of, never. The group in living appealed to me because it would take care of the lonesomeness. I wouldn't be alone. Many women go through this. Unfortunately, we're in a period of our lives where the men die earlier than the women. Uh, but I have to change my way of living because I live by myself in the apartment in Albany Park. And I was very lonely. I did live with my daughter before I came here, but uh, it didn't work out. And uh, I, I was the one that wanted to get out. Many women lonely. do not want to live with their children. Their children have different lives, different interests, and all it would mean is they'd become a burden. Clara has her own, I have mine. This is the hurdle that women have to deal with, and everyone deals with it in his own way. Miriam's way is a friendship with another widow, her roommate, Trudy Leskowitz. Was supposed to do, and of course I had to do it four times over and over and over again. That's what took all this time. And then the wife came in. Be careful, it's hot. So how's your daughter? Didn't she come today? She will come, Trudy. I told you three times today. They're all coming tonight. Mm -hmm. The whole shebang. My daughter-in-law, my son-in-law, and my granddaughter. How are you? We get together as a family, and those are highlights in my life. Really highlights. I have children. Two children. I have grandchildren. And I have great grandchildren. Five great grandchildren. I love them for who they are. I have a, a relationship with them that is very precious to me. Oh, good. The other day when we were all together, my daughter brought out a little diary that I had kept when I started, when I was 10 years old. Went to my first party. Had a pretty good time. So far, I like wink. <laughs> Post office. <laughs> and spin the bottle. <laughs> There's a thread that goes through your whole life. And when you see some of that in your own children, you feel that your life was not in vain. 
you feel that you that you lived a good life you feel that you you did what you possibly could under the circumstances and uh, there's a f a good feeling of knowing that your children have learned from what you have gone through what your life has meant Dr. Robert Butler, a psychologist, says it's important and healthy for each of us to look back at the mystery, the wonder of our lives. Uh, how did I get here? Uh, what uh, did I do well? Uh, what do I wish I'd done differently, better? Uh, this process of looking back is called the life review. The end result, the payoff of the life review can be a shoring up and a cohesiveness of one's character. That is integrity. One may have been fragmented for a long, long time about a variety of competing thoughts, guilts, conflicts. With the successful resolution of those, one may have a sense of integrity that one's never had before. And that doesn't necessarily mean something grand in the sense of a great memoir that's produced or a work of art. It may be pure survival in which someone can be very proud and feel very whole. In New York, a celebration for Minna Citron. She's an artist. I hope I don't lose my upper plate when I love. You're a little older than Jack, baby. Just don't lose it when you need it. I need help. You blow too. Okay. My mother and father had four sons, and my mother felt terrible because she wanted a daughter. So they kept trying. So I finally came along, and I was the only daughter. And they made a great fuss about me. I was in a co-ed school, manual training high school, and I guess I was in love with love, you know. And so I had lots of boys around that I was attracted to. And they loved to come to my mother's house because she was very friendly and beautiful. And I loved to listen to her because her taffeta petticoat rippled when she walked. And that petticoat had a ruffle on it and a, a, a rhythm, you know, and I loved it. And the taffeta petticoat also had my mother in it, and I loved her this young man that I went around with, and I finally got married. We were kids together. I was 16 and he was 18. And we had good times together, you see? He was a good playmate. But when you get married and you're having children, a playmate isn't exactly what you need. You need a thoughtful person to be a good father to your children and to recognize that if you are a different kind of person, they have to recognize that. You see, he used to say, I never know where to put my hat when I come in because you've moved the piano. You see, so why can't you be like other people and just stay put, do nothing? We had the two children and I thought, that's it. That's all I want. I've got two children now, they're wonderful. And now what am I going to do with the rest of my life? So I went to the New York uh, School of Applied Design for Women, and I came out with some honors and stuff. And I realized I didn't know how to draw a figure. So I went to the Art Students League, and I signed up with Kenneth Hayes Miller, who said, do what you feel like doing. It takes courage to be a woman without any money and leave a man who is very comfortable and get out into the world. Well. I suppose courage is not lacking in me. It's difficult, but you do it. So um, I up and left. It's 50 years later, and at a gallery party in New York, friends pay tribute to Minna Citron's life and work. Her drawings and paintings in the turbulent 1930s showed a society in pain. But later, American abstract painters, including Jackson Pollock, had a freeing influence on Minna's art. I think art is a wonderful therapy. It's like a good physic. You know, it's a psychological physic. It got rid of a lot of tensions and a lot of 
difficulties. When you get to be my age, you don't think so much of future, you think more of past, you see? And uh, if you're talking about when you're 90, whether you're thinking about dying, you see, well, that's something people have to think about any time. Some people die younger, some people die older. I don't want to live to be terribly, terribly old. And when I die, that's that. But in the meantime, I just want to go on enjoying life if I can and working. I think I've done my best. It's a lot to take care of. I want to say that. Now, the painting for that is my largest painting, and my granddaughter out in Denver has it on loan, I hope. The paintings and the correspondence you have, with, I feel as though I'm curator to a career. And I just like to go on. And I love people, and I love my friends. And I like new friends like you. <laughs> I think in old age, people reap the perceived benefits of a long life. They can describe that life to you in terms of its richness, its complexity, its having savored many, many aspects of life and the humanity part of that. And while Dylan Thomas talked about going raging into that last good night, still most old people go gently into that last period uh, and of death and the preparation for death and not raging into it. There is an equanimity that comes over most older people and a sense of having uh, been a survivor and a coper and uh, in that sense having made it. Our life journey has often been compared to a river on which all of us travel, each in our own season, early, middle, and late adulthood, infancy, and childhood. At the end of the journey, we hope, there's an inner place of serenity from which we go gently. Some of us may realize that our personal integrity, our sense that it was a good life, is part of something larger, a larger web of meaning in which our family, our work, and our story live on. Some of us learn that what is old and dying can be transformed. George Nakashima, master woodcarver. I think the wood tradition is something that you, you just don't come into just because you want to make furniture out of wood. Uh, it's something that's been within the family, it's sort of in your genes, this uh, love of wood. You can see his love of wood in the evolution of this American walnut. It will be transformed from tree to slab to finished wood sculpture. Even though his wood sculptures are shown in museums all over the world, Nakashima makes furniture that is a part of life, not distant from it. Furniture that's to be used, not enshrined. He feels that the wood has a soul. George Nakashima's life began 84 years ago in Spokane, Washington. To help pay his way through college, he worked on the railroad as a gandy dancer. Have you ever heard of a gandhi dancer? It's kind of a dancing movement that you do with the shovel to get the gravel underneath the ties. And I made a handsome sum of 27 cents an hour, which at that time wasn't bad. From Spokane, Nakashima went on a journey which took him to Seattle, where he studied forestry. Then to MIT for architecture. On to Paris for design and modern art. His journey was fitful as he searched for a life of simplicity, directness, and wisdom. Everybody was poor. Nobody had any money, and it was a wonderful, creative life. But gradually I felt that that was not the answer. 
there'd be times when I'd turn a corner in the crooked streets in Paris and, and I'd have an overwhelming feeling of death. Premonitions of death became a reality for millions as World War II erupted in Europe. Soon after Nakashima returned to the West Coast, the Japanese struck Pearl Harbor. Though born in America, George Nakashima, his wife and baby daughter, were sent to an internment camp. It's a very rough life. Our child, my, our daughter, was only six weeks old when we went in. And uh, my wife, she was very much concerned about you know, whether she could feed her properly and whether what her health could be. But the family stayed healthy and intact. For George Nakashima, like many of us, a tragic event, ironically, had a good outcome. While at the camp, he became an apprentice to a Japanese master carpenter trained in the ancient tradition. He learned a skill which remained with him all of his life. The way out of the camp was through the sponsorship of an American architect he had known in Paris, who offered him work. In 1944, he came to New Hope, Pennsylvania, which has been his home ever since. Over 40 years later, with his wife Marion, Nakashima's still at work, continuing his love of wood and searching for its soul. His daughter Mira, who was a baby in that internment camp, and his son Kevin, 33, will carry on the tradition. Trees do have a soul. I know that with a tree, you can read the whole history. If one has the eyes to see, you can tell when there was a great drought. And you can tell when there, when there was an injury that was healed over. You can tell when there's a great happiness in a tree, that the joy and express itself in its grains and its bark and its fibers, just like human beings. At the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City, Nakashima's Altar of Peace. I have practically no feeling of regret for anything that I've done. If I were to do them over again, I might have done them differently, but uh, but that's, I think, anybody's prerogative to develop things in his own way. One of our jobs, I think, is to take these great living things that have died or will die and give them a second life. It's a great feeling, I think, to be a part of that, to be a part of nature and to be a part of life itself. This television series has been not so much about biology or sociology or psychology. It's been about lives, each of our lives, lives that become stories that connect us all. If we use seasons of life as a metaphor for all that happens, then it's good to remember that after every winter follows a spring. <laughs>